since this is the Feeling Reasons um, workshop or conference, I thought I'd start with um, this quote by Solomon. And it's about what he describes as the myth of the passions. And the basic claim is that um, it's the treatment of emotions as irrational forces beyond our control, disruptive and stupid, unthinking and counterproductive, <coughs> against our better interests, and often ridiculous. So this is something that perhaps people identify with the early modern conception of emotions. And you might view the last, perhaps the last three decades of emotion research in philosophy and to an extent in cognitive psychology as a full-blown assault on this myth. So I think this is a safe space. So people tend to think that emotions can be um, rational. So by that, I think at least what I'd like to mean is that they can hey, um, assist um, reasoning. And because of that, they might be described as being rational, i.e. they make their bearers rational. So what I'm really interested in is, given this ass assumption about um, rationality, how do we understand emotional irrationality in such a framework? And what I'm really interested in is what cognitive architecture might tell us about emotional rationality and irrationality. So what I'm really borrowing is the whole talk's really about this one quote from de Sousa, where he says the role of emotions is to supply the insufficiency of reasoning by imitating the encapsulation of perceptual modes. Now, I'll tell you what that means in a, in a second. But I think what's interesting is if cognitive architecture has implications for emotional rationality and irrationality, it means that we can't completely understand the notion of irrationality through armchair speculation or a priori reasoning. You need to know about the architecture of the mind as well. And I should, I, should, I should say this up front. I don't think I'm going to be proposing a rival account of emotional irrationality. I think you can be a pluralist about this. There's many notions of irrationality. I'm just trying to give you an account that's empirically informed, hopefully, and empirically tractable as, as well. So that's the main incentive for this, for this talk. Um, OK, so what's this whole thing about encapsulation? Um, so a system in cognitive science um, is informationally encapsulated if the function it computes is insensitive to information stored in other systems. So um, there's an assumption, which I think one can challenge, but it's, it's widely regarded um, as being true, which is that perception is informationally encapsulated. So the basic idea is perceptual processing is insensitive to what's going on elsewhere in the mind. So things like high-level cognition, what you believe, what you think or judge, doesn't have a bearing on what you perceive. Perceptual processing is insensitive to those things. And that's what we mean by um, information encapsulation. And de Sousa's, I guess, claim is that emotions mimic this feature. They mimic information encapsulation, at least in some cases, and that's why emotions turn out to be rational. And that's what I'm going to try and use to give an account of emotional irrationality. So the question that I'm really interested in is, is this. Um, what role does the information encapsulation of emotions play in explaining how emotions can be irrational? So that's what I'm going to try and address in, in this talk. OK, so it's always bad to put a long quote, but um, sorry, this is kind of essential to the, to the talk. So for de Sousa, um, the role it does really um, is cashed out in terms of how encapula encapsulation features in answering the philosopher's frame problem. Now, the frame problem is really a problem in artificial intelligence, and this problem is slightly different. So I'm just going to focus on this problem instead of the actual frame problem in AI. Um, and the problem goes something like this. Um, we need to know when not to retrieve some irrelevant information from the vast store of which we are possessed. But how do we know it's, it's irrelevant unless we have already retrieved it? 
I prefer a very general biological hypothesis. Emotion spares the paralysis potentially induced by this predicament by controlling the salience of features of perception and reasoning. They temporarily mimic the information encapsulation of perception and so circumscribe our practical and cognitive options. There's a, there's a lot going on here, um, but the basic idea is this. Any given time you're supposed to emotionally respond to something and choose your behavioral response, there's almost an infinite or perhaps infinite amount of information you're supposed to pay attention to. Um, and you can't tell by reasoning what you're supposed to pay attention to because you can't tell what's relevant unless you've considered it. And if the information is infinite, you're kind of stuck because you have to assess all the information before you can figure out how you're supposed to respond to a given situation. So that's the frame problem. And the point of emotions is that it acts as a biasing mechanism. It highlights certain information and neglects others. So it tells you what to, what to pay attention to, what to think about, and then you can behaviorally respond to something in virtue of that. And information encapsulation is supposed to play a role in that. Now, I think there's actually two features of the frame problem. Um, one is information construed as per perceptual stimuli. And this is what I think evolutionary psychologists like Ketela and Todd talk about. So they argue that um, specific emotions might help to solve the problem of what information to attend to in specific environmental circumstances. So if you're walking in the woods and you hear a noise I think that, and you feel scared, I think the fear is supposed to highlight the sound as opposed to looking at the, the beautiful scenery or something like that. So it's, it's visual stimuli that you're supposed to focus on focus on. The next part has to do with um, information understood as what you're supposed to reason about. So you get this claim by Dimasio, which I'm going to more or less assume in this talk, which is that it's perhaps accurate to say that the purpose of reasoning is deciding and that the, and that the essence of deciding is selecting a response option. And if you buy into that, you might also think that um, emotions draw your attention to certain response options and eliminate others. So in on the one hand, they let you focus on certain environmental stimuli. And on the other hand, it also lets you focus on certain response options and disregard other ones. So, but in both cases, the role of emotions is the same, um, that you draw your attention to certain things, certain pieces of information, and eliminate others. So again, the whole point is emotions function as a biasing mechanism and highlight certain pieces of information. And I think, at least on, given the quote I've, I've, I've read out, um, for D'Souza, this is achieved by emotions temporarily mimicking the information encapsulation of um, perception. So I think that's, I mean, I don't really know how to interpret D'Souza because it's, it's very dense and very complicated. And it's quite rich, but it's also, um, I shouldn't say this, but frustrating to read sometimes. Um, we can edit that part out if this is goes, goes online. Um, but I think that's not the real important role that information encapsulation plays. So I think if you read him carefully, he has his whole framework where he assumes that emotions have a certain biological function. And the biological function of emotions is to determine the salience of patterns of, sorry, of features of perception and reasoning. And it's, so what do you mean by, by salience? I think the background assumption is something like emotions have something like a valence, so they're positive or negative, or they feel good or they feel bad, and in virtue of that, they, um, they make the options or what they represent feel good or bad as well. And that's what draws your attention to certain pieces of information, and whereas you neglect other pieces of information. Um, so the sound that you hear in the woods, that you don't know what it is, draws your attention, it feels kind of scary, or feels bad in some sense, it gives you a thumbs down reaction, and that's why you pay attention to that and neglect I don't know, the greenery 
So on this side, this kind of this picture, it's the salience, however you want to understand it, that determines what you're supposed to pay attention to and inquire about and reason about as well. And you can tell this story without assuming anything about information encapsulation. So you don't need to know anything about the cognitive architecture of the mind per se um, to understand how emotions help you, in a way, solve the frame problem. So it remains unclear what encapsulation is really supposed to, to be doing here. So I think the role it does is can be understood given what information encapsulation is supposed to, to be. So the notion is that um, you, can, you, can do you can process information without, resp without taking account of background information already stored in, in other systems. So you can emotionally respond to something without cons already figuring out what you believe about the environment, what you know, what, what's happening tomorrow. So those kinds of things seem to be irrelevant given this notion of encapsulation. If that's, if that's right, um, the whole benefit of information encapsulation is that you can process information in a quick and efficient manner. So the real price of encapsulation is speed. So salience is what determines what you're supposed to pay attention to, <coughs> but encapsulation ensures that you can pay attention to things in a quick and efficient manner. Um, whether this solves the frame problem depends on how, do you, how you understand the problem, but it might be the case that um, you need to solve the problem in an efficient manner because it might be costly to the organism if you take your time. If it takes you two days to figure out if you should leave, leave the forest when you hear noise, you might, you know, you're going to die probably. <laughs> so, so I think in certain cases at least you want um, speed and that's ensured by information encapsulation of your emotion processing modules. So <clears throat> that's it's probably got a bit distracting. Um, so that's <clears throat> supposed to give you an account of how encapsulation helps you with reasoning and how emotions can be rational because of that. So it's not that encapsulation is necessary for emotional rationality. It's more that it, help, it provides the mechanisms by which you might be able to be emotionally rational. Because um, so the, the essence of rationality on this picture is salience, not encapsulation. So I think that's what you can kind of glean from de Sousa's um, picture, or at least one of the stories he tells in his, in his book. So I'm interested in deriving an account of emotional irrationality from from this picture. And there's, I think there's two, two ways to go here. Here's a very obvious um, take on it. <clears throat> Sorry. So the setup is that emotions have a biological function and they're rational when they fulfill this function. So of, of course, one easy way to go is to assume that emotions turn out to be irrational when they stop fulfilling their biological function. So when they fail to determine patterns of salience. So when they fail to draw your attention to certain pieces of information. This is the obvious way to go, but I don't think this is the right way to go. Simply because I think this gives you an account of emotional a rationality, not irrationality. I think this is informative, but this isn't going to um, help with my, my aim. And the reason is that if, if emotions don't draw your attention to certain pieces of information, if they don't act as a biasing mechanism, it just leaves reasoning as it were. It doesn't make the situation any worse. So emotions, people describe emotions as, as distorting reasoning. This isn't going to tell you how emotions distort reasoning. It's just, going to, it's just going to tell you that emotions don't help with reasoning at all. So that's one reason not to, not to go with this, this story. The, the way that I liked, I'd like to go draws on the purpose of the biological function. So I assume that emotions have a biological function, and that's to determine salience. Why is that important? You might think, and I think 
uh, tell me if you think this is implausible. I think it's plausible that um, the biological function of an immersion is geared towards achieving a further end and achieving a, a further set of goals. And one of these goals might be ensuring the survival of the organism. Um, so if you stick with a picture like this, I think you can derive a different take on emotional irrationality, which is that emotions are irrational when they disrupt reasoning by limiting the set of information we pay attention to to our detriment. So emotions are irrational when, not when they stop us paying attention to certain things, but when they make us pay attention to certain things in a way that would be bad for our survival or whatever the other goals you want as well. I think survival is at least one of the goals. So you might think um, a phobia might be an instance of this. So if you have a phobia of snakes and say you live in Australia or somewhere like that where there's a lot of, lot of snakes, um, it might normally be a, a good thing to have your attention drawn to things like snakes and spiders. But if you have a debilitating fear of snakes and if you live in Australia, it's, it's going to be pretty detrimental that you are fixated on the, on the spider and you can't leave your house because of that. So you can't do groceries, you can't go to work, you can't find a mate, you'll probably die in your really expensive apartment room, right? Um, that's what's going to happen to you. Um, so that's the picture that I'm, I'm proposing of emotional irrationality. So they focus your attention onto certain things but in a way that's bad for you in terms of achieving your goals, especially survival. Um, again, note, I haven't said anything about cognitive architecture or encapsulation. So again, it seems like you can tell a story of emotional irrationality on the dissociative picture without mentioning cognitive architecture and especially without mentioning information encapsulation. Okay, so the... the the quote I suggested at the start from de Sousa seems to be at least somewhat misleading if you take it at face value. So, so what I'm really interested in, I mean, my whole project was to try and figure out what cognitive architecture tells you about um, emotional irrationality. And so far, it's not going well. Um, it seems to be kind of irrelevant, right? So you have this nice picture. Empirical sciences can inform what we do, but actually not easy to see why it's relevant. Um, so I think it's relevant in, in two ways. So here's one way information encapsulation might still matter for emotional irrationality. Is, is this like, okay. Okay. I thought there was a warning that I was going to say something really wrong, right? <laughs> Just be warned. The one original thing the speaker has to say, well, that's, that's the worst part. Um, okay, so, so I think um, how emotions disrupt reasoning might be explained in terms of a failure of information encapsulation. Um, so you might think that in certain cases, um, emotions tend to not be encapsulated. And if it's not, it means that when, when you emotionally respond to something, you do take account of background knowledge, especially knowledge about what you believe or what you judge and so on. Um, so the upshot is you, you're still able to pay attention to certain things, but you can't do it in an efficient manner. And that's going to be bad at least on, on some, some cases. So the case, the example of the kind of um, hearing a noise in the woods, and if it takes you three hours to figure out whether you should go and pay attention to that or if you should stop being loud, um, that's going to be bad for you. So that's a way in which emotions seem to um, hinder reasoning by information encapsulation failing. Um, that's one way to go. I think. Uh, a slightly better way to go is um, um, in terms of the success of information encapsulation. Um, so on this account, um, emotions might be part of the story of why we can't successfully control for emotional responses 
even when we know them to be detrimental. So what I'm really getting at here is when emotions turn out to be informationally encapsulated, how you emotionally respond to a situation is insensitive to background information, especially information stored in um, things to do with high-level cognition, like what you believe and desire. Now, you might actually come to believe that how you normally emotionally respond to something is really bad for you. So you might, you might fear flying, and you know that it's really bad for you to fear flying every time you, you fly. But because these emotional responses are encapsulated, you can't control them. Um, that's the whole point. You react in a really quick, quick way. Um, and that's one way emotions might distort um, reasoning as well. So they do still highlight certain things. So they still act as a biasing mechanism. But they, again, they seem to bias you in a way that's bad for you to achieve your, your goals. A and it means that it's something that you can't really account for in so far, so far as um, these responses are encapsulated. So I think that's the second way emotions turn out to be, um, turn out to distort reasoning. It, it, so another way of looking at this is that emotions are still highlighting certain pieces of information and disregarding others, but they're highlighting the wrong kinds of information, information that will be, will be bad for you, um, especially as an organism. Um, so, one thing to say is I've given you two accounts of emotional irrationality, um, or at least two accounts of how encapsulation might bear on emotional irrationality. One that uses the, the failure of encapsulation to account for what role it plays, and one that uses the success of information encapsulation to explain how it plays a role in emotional irrationality. Um, and you don't need to be perhaps a genius to figure out that that seems to be kind of inconsistent. And I want to argue that it's, it's not inconsistent because the whole, the, the claim that D'Souza makes, I think, which is empirically supported, is, is that emotions aren't always informationally encapsulated. They just turn out to be encapsulated in some, some cases. And I think the support for this comes from um, certain models of emotion generation, um, which tells you that there's at least two different ways emotions can be generated. And this seems to be um, supported at least for the case of fear. So you have a neurobiological account of emotion generation, which tells you that um, there's two different emotion circuits involved in fear responses. One is a thalamus to amygdala circuit, which bypasses the cortex and um, in Ledoux's terms, it's, it's supposed to be quick and dirty. Um, and it occurs without the um, conscious experience of the subject. So you can um, sometimes, I think the evidence suggests that when you see something like a snake, a snake or something that looks like a snake, you emotionally respond to it without, without having first taken into account that it's a snake or being conscious of the, the stimuli. Um, and the second um, circuit is a thalamus to cortex to amygdala, amygdala circuit, which is slow and occurs with the conscious experience of the stimuli. So um, fear responses generated in the first way are informationally encapsulated. And you could argue that fear responses generated in the second way turn out to be um, failed. They fail to be informationally um, encapsulated. So these circuits are sensitive to what's going on elsewhere um, in your cognitive architecture. So sensitive to background information. So I think this A lends support for the view that in emotional processing can be encapsulated, and it also lends support for the view that um, they can also be they can fail to be encapsulated as well. And I think because of that, that lends support for the two stories about emotional irrationality that I provided, one that draws on the success of encapsulation and one that draws on the failure of encapsulation. Um, so that's the rough picture. Let me just end by highlighting two limitations um, with, with understanding emotional irrationality in this way. Um, one is that this whole picture that still relies on emotions acting as a biasing mechanism and drawing attention to information, it seems like this picture is really supported empirically 
when it comes to negative emotions, especially fear. So it's not clear if they generalize to, to positive emotions. So I think philosophers normally say, well, at least it seems intu intuitive that with positive emotions, they, they open up the world. So when you're in love, you know, you, you, the whole world is open to you in a way that when, you, when you're really anxious, you just fix it on the object of your, your anxiety. I mean, I don't know if this is true. I mean, think about lust. Like, that really draws your attention to one particular thing, and that seems fairly positive to me. Um, so I think this just, just remains unclear whether you can generalize to, to positive emotions. Um, the second thing is that um, most of the um, empirical evidence to, show, to suggest that emotions act as a biasing mechanism only really speak to how it highlights certain perceptual stimuli. So it's not clear if emotions highlight certain response options as well. So remember the frame problem, I said there's two pieces of information you're supposed to highlight. One is the perceptual stimuli, the other is which um, response options you're supposed to take to a situation as well. And both of them seem to be required to solve the frame problem. And it seems like only one of them is um, empirically supported. So that's another drawback of, of this picture. Um, but I don't think these limitations are, um, I mean, they don't have, to, they don't seem, they don't need to be objections to the, to the view. It just makes your view a bit more, um, just have a more specific claim. So one thing you might still want to say is information encapsulation of emotion processing can explain certain instances of, of emotional rationality, even though it can't explain all, all instances. So I should should end there. Thanks. Thank you.